Definitely. Yeah. Okay, good. And live in their self-designed log home in Myersville. We appreciate him being here today and look forward to his insight into understanding healthcare basics. Thank you. When I walked in here today, I glanced around the crowd, and I'm looking at white hair, blue hair, uh, <laughs> gray hair, and I'm going, I'm in the right place. <laughs> this is my kind of crowd. <laughs> um, a lot of people don't realize this, but this is an aging population in the United States. And as the ladies mentioned before, lots of people are coming to the door of Medicare every day. In fact, 10,000 people are coming to Medicare every day. Now, you take 10,000 times 365 times 19, and you're talking about the baby boom generation is flooding into the system to the tune of 69 million people over the next 19 years. So we have a whole lot of people coming to Medicare, and in my business, among us agents, that's what's known as the silver tsunami. And we, <laughs> we kind of like it. It means opportunity. Now, i got a question for everybody here. How many of you are paying for your Medicare right now? Okay. Second question. How many of you are paying federal taxes? Hopefully everybody, right? <laughs> Here's the point. If you are paying uh, your federal income taxes, you're paying for Medicare right now. And I don't care how young you or how old you are. With every paycheck you've ever developed, you're paying for Medicare. Now the reason behind that is it's mandatory. Most people don't realize there was a mandate put out 45 years before the Affordable Care Act, which instituted the individual mandate. What you're paying for is this, Medicare Part A, your hospital, hospice, and skilled nursing coverage. And it's never changed. And you only get to get, of course, your Medicare when you get to be 65. Now, I've been asked to talk about basics about health insurance as well as other parts about Medicare. But let's talk about the basics right now of health insurance. It's kind of simple to understand. We'll use car insurance as an example because all health insurance and, and car insurance and shawl insurances are essentially the same. What you have is people that pay claims, or rather, excuse me, pay premiums but don't have claims. So they're pouring money into an insurance company. And then there's the people that wreck the cars who are having claims. And of course, the money coming in over, overcomes or pays for the claims. And there's more than enough money then to pay for the overhead and make a profit, which is what it's really all about, isn't it? OK, well, that's what health insurance is the same way, right? There is no difference. You've got young, healthier people who don't have a whole lot of claims because they're young and healthy. And then you've got older people on the other end of this thing that are having less claims. And then you want to be able to have that money to overcome that. Now, what happens if you don't have people who are younger not paying into the system? What happens then? Well, then you've got an, a lopsided system, right? Which is why this thing called the individual mandate exists. The idea was that everybody has to have health insurance, whether they like it or not. And if they don't like it, then they're going to get a penalty. Speaking of penalties, I forgot. i got to wear glasses these days. <laughs> As you get older, you get more blind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is government speak right here. The tax is calculated on a monthly basis and is the greater of either a fixed dollar amount or 2.5% of a household income above the tax filing limit, up to the national average premium uh, for a bronze 60% actuarial value health plan. Okay, simple, right? The IRS has announced that as that for the 2017 tax filing season, the average bronze plan premium used for calculating the maximum penalty will be $272 for each member of a tax tax household, up to 1,360 bucks for five or more members. Simple. But let's put it this way. There is money coming into the system, even though the way, our, we have think, the way things are going right now, uh, our president has actually recommended that you don't pay your penalty. But like it or not, the IRS is still collecting it. So, because <laughs> the law hasn't changed. And as we all know, the Affordable Care Act, the idea was to repeal and replace 
Well, that just hasn't happened yet, has it? We all know there's been, unless, unless you've lived under a rock, we all know that there's been one hell of a fight here for the last nine or ten months over this whole thing, and it's not changed, really. So, when it comes to our system right now, we have a problem in that it is also being, it's also being killed a little bit at a time when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, because they're being encouraged to go elsewhere. Just a few weeks ago, the president announced things called association group plans. And I know all about that because that's where I started in 1999. And let me tell you, things are going to change when people who are healthy do start going that direction, which means there's people bleeding away from all that money coming in, which means eventually what's going to happen to the Affordable Care Act isn't going to be good. Now, let's talk about insurance basics more. There is this thing called out-of-pocket. Out-of-pocket means deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance. Most of the people in this room right now, well, a lot of you are on Medicare, but you were all, a lot of you were on in the group market. And when you're on the group market, you have relatively minor deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance as compared to the individual market. It's always been that way. So let's talk about the most fundamental stuff of all. You've got co-payments, you've got co-insurance, Ooh, the mysterious co-insurance, and you have the deductibles, all right? So let's say everybody knows what a co-payment is. You go to the doctor, you pay 20 or 30 bucks, you're done. But let's say you then have to have a, an MRI that costs $1,000. And let's say the deductible on your plan through your employer plan is $2,000. That means then this $1,000, you've got a, it's an 80-20 plan. That means the plan will pay 80% of it, and you've got to pay the other 20% of it, up to a maximum out of pocket of 2,000 bucks, after which it's 100% coverage, right? That's how it works. Well, the individual market is exactly the same, except that they've always had higher deductibles, higher co-payments, higher, co high, higher uh, uh, premiums, because they also were less expensive, but they're not less expensive anymore. When you're talking about the Affordable Care Act, a lot of things have changed because these policies have to cover everything. Now let me tell you about the bad old days where I actually started in 1999 and why Obamacare even exists. Back in old 1999, I started with something called the National Association for the Self-Employed. That was for people, small business people, not groups, but mom and pop. And what they had then was the idea was to join an association to get the economies of scale possibly to get a better buy, all right? And what they would get is all kinds of little benefits like AARP like actually has for seniors right now, where you have things like discounts on hotel, discount dental, all that kind of stuff. And it was actually pretty reasonable stuff. What was not, what was, but that really wasn't the focus. What was really the focus was the health insurance because that's the profit center back then, okay? So the health insurance was like this back then. If you had a pre-existing condition, it would be noted. But first, let's talk about how these things were limited benefit plans. There wasn't a company out there that wasn't limited benefits. I don't care if it was called Care First or Aetna, Cigna, or a company called Mega Life and Health or Golden Rule or whatever. Every one of those plans stopped at a lifetime max. And you could have picked a plan that was like for a million bucks, or maybe two million bucks, or three million bucks. But we all know that if you went to a cheap plan, like a million dollar plan, these days chronic diseases, a million bucks is no big deal anymore, right? So that was a bad idea. So people did have situations where they got sick, it went up to a million bucks, and then it stopped. That's kind of horrible. But then it's, that's just the way it was. Then they were, many of them were cafeteria style. Cafeteria style meant you get to pick and choose things that you don't want. And believe me, I've had people say, I'm never going to get sick. <laughs> I've heard this only about a million, million times, right? I don't care if you're 25. Somebody's going to get sick sooner or later. And I don't need prescription drug coverage. So they never put it in there. Then they get sick. Then they need medication for MS or something like that. And they find out how horrible it can be when it comes to the cost of prescription drugs. Then there's this thing like the maternity rider. 40-year-old couple, got a couple of kids already. We're not doing that again, dear. So, <laughs> so they didn't put a maternity rider in there. And then there's this, oops, 
and somebody gets pregnant again, and now it's all on you. The entire maternity, the childbirth, everything, it's your problem because you didn't pick it at the right time. Okay? And then there's the pre existing rule. I've sat in front of thousands of clients talking about pre existing health conditions. Let me tell you, just about anybody can come down with something. Like, most people don't realize this, but you guys have heard of ALS? You've heard of Lou Gehrig's disease? Anybody can come down with ALS at any age. They don't know why. They don't know how to fix it. They don't know if it's bacterial or virus or genetic. All they know is that when you've got it, you're going to die. It's that simple. So anybody can get these kind of diseases. So anyhow, <laughs> I digress a bit. But when it comes to... Uh, the pre-existing scenario. Let's look at this family called the Heffelfinger family. Mr. Heffelfinger, he's a bit overweight, but not obese, and he smokes. So back then, he'd get what's called a rate-up. They would simply charge more money because he's just more risky, all right, which means they might charge 100 bucks more because of that little issue. Then there is Mrs. Heffelfinger. She's a little plump, but she also has diabetes, and she's type 2 diabetes, and she takes medication for that, but not insulin. But at the same time, she has hypertensive heart disease, which is to say she's got high blood pressure. And she also has high cholesterol. Your actuarial, then, at an insurance company would look at that and go, wow, that's a walking time bomb. You are uninsurable. Have a nice day. Then there's, then there's Johnny. Little Johnny's 14 years old, he's in perfect shape, no big deal. Then there's little Rudy. Rudy has something called asthma, and those, he has asthma attacks on occasion and he takes medication. But you know what we're going to do for you, Rudy? We're going to cover you, you know, if you have a heart attack or something like that. But when it comes to asthma, that's going to be waived. We will not cover that which you need the coverage for because it could cost us money. So there are waivers then. That means the prescription's their problem. That means if he has an attack and ends up in the ER, it's their problem. So in other words, a potential out-of-pocket can be quite significant. So that was the bad old days. That's how things always were. Then the Affordable Care Act comes in in 2010, or 20, I think it was 2010, and that was all eliminated. Now, nah, you can't discriminate now. Pre-existing conditions must be covered. Unlimited benefits doesn't just stop at a million bucks or something like that. Your kid, who by the way, on the old system, when he got to be like 19, if he wasn't going to college, get lost, kid, go get your own policy. But nowadays, you can be there to, to, till the age of 26, right, on the on the plan. There are also kinds of all kinds of preventive care that's dialed in to Obamacare, meaning instead of worrying about your deductible, if you want to get a colonoscopy, go get your colonoscopy before it turns into cancer, which made sense. Mam mammographies, all that kind of stuff, mammograms, rather, all that sort of thing. So there's some great ideas there. But at the same time, you have to pay for things you might not want. I'm on Obamacare, okay? Do I want to pay for maternity? Oh no, we're quite done with that. Um, <laughs> do I want to pay for pediatric dental care? Do I want to pay for drug rehab? No, but I have to for, for other people that are having that problem. And that was the kind of part, that was also what made these things so expensive. But now look at our world today. Our president is basically saying, I'm going to kill this thing because you, Congress, aren't doing your job. You're supposed to repeal and replace this thing by now. Well, so he says, go to this association plans. That's a tiny little hole in the tire. He says, we're not going to pay the subsidies, the poor people that are on there, who are getting subsidized by the government, we're taking that away. We're not going to pay that anymore. What do you think is going to happen to those people then? They're going to start peeling off too. And this uncertainty in the market makes the insurance companies, whose only thing in life is profitability, raise rates and raise deductibles. I've got a policy right now. I pay, I pay $1,270 a month. We have a deductible of $6,550 each, so my potential out-of-pocket is $13,100 before that piece of uh, that wonderful plan does something, okay? And I just got a love notice from Care First that it's going up 
and and that's the HMO. The PPOs are 50% increase. And I have the opportunity to change my plan starting November 1. That's the open enrollment for the Affordable Care Act, or poorly named, by the way, but the Affordable Care Act, and I can probably go to another higher deductible plan. Do I want to do that? No, but luckily, in a few months, I'll be on Medicare. <laughs> and I can leave this behind, but then i got to worry about my wife for the next year and a half. Uh, now, here's my prediction about all of this sort of thing. There's so much uncertainty in the market. Right now on the exchange, there's only two insurance carriers, Care First and Kaiser. At the beginning of all of this, there was five. The first one to split the area was Aetna, I think it was. Then there was uh, United Healthcare, and there was a co-op out there called Evergreen, and I believe Evergreen just went out of business, literally went out of business. So what's left now is just Care First and just the uh, uh, Kaiser. So what's going to happen, I think, in 2018, they're dialed in to continue to be there. But in 2019, who knows? Will they even participate? Will there be anybody participating in Maryland by 2019? I have no idea. But I will tell you this. If that all happens, like I'm talking about, you're going to see this, this inflated tire, which has now got some minor holes in it, becoming major holes in it, and it's going to go flat. So you're going to see Obamacare die all on its own sooner or later. It may take two or three years, but it's going to go unless Congress gets off its duff and does something. And that doesn't seem real, right, real likely right now, right? So I'm not seeing a whole lot of encouragement right now. So that's my prediction about that. Now, there's three markets. There's always been the individual market. There has always been the employer's group market, and there's always been the senior market. Why is that? Why don't we have like the single payer system? Why aren't we like Europe and Canada and parts of Asia? Well, it's because it all kind of started a long time ago. Back in 1912, President Teddy Roosevelt recommended that we should probably have universal health care. That didn't take during his day. But it was the next Roosevelt, Franklin, who, after this country had gone through a terrible depression, started the New Deal and came up with Social Security for All, and a part of that was supposed to be health care for all. That didn't happen during his administration, but then Harry Truman took it up, and he tried to get health care for all, not once, but twice. And then the next president was a conservative, of course, being Eisenhower. Now, let me just say one thing here. I'm an independent, registered independent. You can't not talk about politics in healthcare in this country. It's impossible not to. So don't quote me on a whole lot of things or have my personal opinions. But when it comes to conservatives, ever since 1935, they made it very clear. We do not want to have government involved in healthcare, period, right? Well, okay, so we didn't have Eisenhower do anything. And then there was Kennedy. Kennedy is the one that actually amended the idea to 65-year-olds and beyond. But it was, of course, Johnson that got it put through because of Kennedy being assassinated. And <laughs> Mr. Johnson, rather, President Johnson twisted some arms, shall we say, and got it put through. And then after it was... Um, signed, he flew down to Independence, Missouri, to the Truman Library, and he signed the actual bill in front of Harry Truman and gave President Harry Truman the first Medicare card. That's got number two. And it's been that way, and millions of Americans have been on Medicare ever since. Currently, there's 57.7 million Americans on Medicare. The next president, by the way, after Johnson, Nixon, actually expanded it. It was a progressive Republican. And what he did was to add not just 65-year-olds, but the disabled under the age of 65, and those people with end-stage renal failure. Why that one particular disease? I have no idea. 
but that actually did add millions to the, to the whole bin. So we have 57.7 million people on Medicare right now. We have about 60 million people, the poor, on Medicaid, right? And then we have the military, the veterans, and of course, the people that are active. Let's chip on another 20 million. So when you think about it, we have about 140 million people that are covered in part or in full by the government right now. How well did that work out, conservatives? <laughs> it really didn't. I mean, it's, it's a terrible failure. You know, if you really want to get back to the point of having nobody, I mean, you know, covered by government, I don't know how you turn that Titanic around. I really don't. I'm just telling you that most people, and you've got 69 million more people coming to Medicare. So, and that's, and that's the closest thing this nation has to universal health care, socialized health care, as you've been paying for it all your working life. Now, um, let's talk about some Medicare basics. Um, since a lot of you are on Medicare, I think, in this room right now, um, you know there's four parts to Medicare. A, B, C, and D. A, you know, is the hospital, hospice, and skilled nursing coverage. If you look at this silly little book right here, which I suspect a lot of you have, the Medicare oh, book, God. it is written in Latin, so, <laughs> so understanding it is kind of difficult to do, right? But it says in this book, there is no cost for Part A. What a bunch of crap. You've been paying for it all your life. You're just allowed not to have it. And your Part B then, and think of A, by the way, as inpatient services. Inpatient means you're overnight in the hospital. You're not leaving. It's the expensive part of healthcare. But Part B is the workhorse. That is your uh, outpatient services. Now you're talking about doctor visits, tests, labs, emergency room, physical therapy, outpatient surgeries, um, uh, durable medical equipment, imaging services, you name it. But they're not overnight. You can get a chemo treatment in a hospital or go home the same day, that's outpatient, right? So when you link the two together, when you decide to link the two together, which you could do at 65 or after you've gotten off of your employer plan and then you want to go do it, you then have major medical being offered to you by the government. But you do have one little issue here, and that is it's health insurance. Well, like any health insurance, you've got deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance. We call that out of pocket. But very wisely back in 1965, the government came up with not only what's called original medical care here, but they also came out with supplemental policies to fill the gaps, which are really called Medigap policies. And Medigap policies are, are policies that fill the gaps. They're secondary policies you purchase to fill the gaps and supplement your potential loss out of your pocket. What are the gaps? These days, 2017, there's a $1,316 hospital deductible, but it's not per year. It's per 60-day period. If you're in the hospital more than once with a separation of more than 60 days, you can pay $1,316 more than once. If you're in the hospital up to 60 days on the 61st day, then the hospital starts charging $329 more per day. And if you're really bad off and in the hospital up to 90 days, they charge $658 more per day. That's just the potential out of pocket on part A. On part B, you have a deductible of 183 bucks once a year. But the bad news is it's an 80-20 plan. And this 20% is to infinity. If you have to pay 20% of a $14,000 chemo treatment, that's going to add up real fast, or a $5,000 PET scan, or any other kind of test you have to do, 20%, 20%, 20%. And then there's this thing called excess charge. That's where a doctor can charge beyond what Medicare allows by as much as 15%. So these are the gaps that are built in to Medicare. So the government came up with a simple system, which confuses everybody, because these are called parts. A, B, C, and D. D, by the way, is drugs, okay? But they make plans that are not parts. Plans A, B, C, D, F, F plus, G, K, L, M, and N. Simple, huh? You've got 11 different possible plans to choose from. And for those people that were on an employer's group plan, and they don't have some sort of retirement deal after employment, 
you get you, you then face this go what is this what are all these letters and numbers and stuff what does it do for me now plan f is the cadillac of all plans and i'll bet there's a bunch of people in this room right now that have plan f plan f pays for all of those out-of-pocket expenses it literally you literally pay nothing out of your pocket everybody loves plan f and think about this on the individual market or the group market there was no there is no such thing as a supplemental policy to fill in these gaps but here on medicare you do have that and the supplemental policies and this is my daily wick this is where things get a little weird everybody would think that plan f is the most expensive and they would be right about that because it's the most comprehensive of all the plans why are there 11 plans budget for instance if you had something like a plan a plan a is not a part plan a would not pay for the 1316 dollars the first time but it would cover uh the 329 and the 658 and it would cover the 1316 after the first time Plan A would not cover a service. It wouldn't cover skilled nursing at all. Plan A would not cover the 183, and it would not cover the excess charge. So in reality, you're simply saying, if I want to have a lower monthly premium, and I'm willing to pull more out of my pocket, that's up to you. That's the idea behind that. That's why there's 11 different varieties. And F+, plus, that's a cool one. That's exactly the same as F, except that. It's the high deductible version of F. It's the least expensive plan because it doesn't do anything for the first $2,200. That's on you. Now, the people that I typically sell that to are people that are pretty well off. Like the last guy I sold it to was bringing down $400,000 in retirement. And to him, that's a golf game. So anyhow, <laughs> so everybody, that's why there's so much variety. You get to pick and choose what you want. But it gets even more bizarre. Here's where I come in. Remember this book here? Back to Latin. In this book, you have these different plans enumerated. People look at this chart and go, gee, what does this mean? And the point is this. Medicare puts the holes, the, the gaps in Medicare. And Medicare makes insurance <coughs> products to fill the gaps. But Medicare does not sell them. Medicare contracts it out to private enterprise. And it says to private enterprise, and as you guys know, when you got close to 65, you got attacked by an insurance industry that said, buy my supplement. It is unique. It's not unique. They're all the same. If you have a plan F from that company and a plan F from that company, it is absolutely identical. F is F, no matter where you go. But the government doesn't regulate how much they sell it for. So that means everybody's selling the same thing. Standardized coverage. Even the customer service has to be the same, but they can charge me whatever they want. Yes. And I'm, I'm, as a broker, my deal is to be appointed to everybody. So whoever sells these plans, I'll find them the plan they prefer to have at the lowest premium. And in so doing, I look at, um, I've got one company, for instance, that would love to sell a plan F for $288 a month to a woman, 65-year-old non-smoker. But I have another company who sells the exact same thing for 143 bucks. Which would you like to pay? <laughs> I mean, you want to pay literally double for nothing? And where a lot of seniors make mistakes is they listen to Aunt March, and Aunt March says, I have my golf ladder taken out and I pay nothing. You ought to go with this company here. Well, then she's gonna, if they do, they're gonna get hosed. Because the other company over there is selling the exact same thing for a heck of a lot less. That's why you talk to somebody who does this on a regular basis, who doesn't charge for services, it will just guide you in the right direction. Now, we've been talking about just A and B and supplemental policies. And by the way, these are federal policies, so you can take them anywhere in the United States. To any Medicare provider anywhere in the United States. Got it? So it's a really cool system in that regard. But what's C and D? Is anybody here on an Advantage plan? All right, let's talk about Advantage plans. I'm going to call it, put, put this in perspective. This is called original Medicare. I'll just call that one. 
the, the first one. This is like new Medicare. New Medicare came out in 2006. And what happened was D, drugs, used to be a part of A and B, but then the government took it out in 2006 and made it its own part and vastly expanded the offering. And it also put a kind of a donut hole in the middle of it, which we'll talk about. But C, advantage plans were developed by the government as a way of keeping the cost down to the government and putting more of the responsibility on the shoulders of the senior, but making it sound really attractive. These premiums are really quite low, like maybe 45 bucks. Actually, some advantage plans cost literally nothing, which I'll tell you something, but here you, have a, here you have a $45 plan, and you're taken out of A, you're taken out of B, you're taken out of D, but put into the complete control of some private enterprise company. And that private enterprise company has its own deductibles, its own co-payments, its own co-insurance. And the issue is, the premium is attractive, but the out-of-pocket can be pretty spectacular. 20 bucks to the doctors, 40 bucks to a specialist, um, $300 for an ambulance ride, 175 for your ER visit, and my favorite, the $6,700 maximum out-of-pocket if you end up in a hospital, for instance. So there can be substantial out-of-pocket. The other issue is, transferable, meaning if you were to leave the area in which you live, let's say you live with a child in another state, they are regional, so they met, so, you, so it's not likely you'll have the coverage in that state. So you've got to start all over again. So there's some real disadvantages to these things, and I, I admit I'm not a big fan of these things. I'll give you a little quick story about that one time. I'm working with a guy uh, who in Brunswick, Maryland, who used to be part of the railroad, and he paid literally nothing for his health insurance for 40 years. Hell of a deal. And now he's retiring. And I'm sitting there with him and his adult daughter. And we're doing a whole thing about supplements and all that. And I set him up on a Medigap plan. And to fit at the conclusion of it all, the daughter says to me, you did a good job. I work for CMS, <laughs> which means she works for Medicare. And she says, if you'd have had my father if I had to sell my father an advantage plan, I'd have had him throw you out of here. <laughs> that kind of solidified it for me. Now, this is open enrollment right now. Open enrollment means this. You can change your Part C plan or D plan, but only now, between October 15th and December 7th. This is your shot. Okay? After December 7th, you can't do squat. And... If you want to change it, and I'm going to talk about prescriptions here now, you really have to do one thing that's important here. You have to look at whatever medications you're taking, and we're going to go to this now, the most beguiling part of Medicare. If you think what we just said here so far is complicated, let's talk drugs. Now you're talking about <laughs> now you're talking about it a little bit more complication. Here is Medicare Part D, and here's the donut hole in it. Wouldn't be surprised if somebody's hit this thing called the donut hole here. But let's pretend if you got a medication that at retail cost 100 bucks. Well, you don't buy it at retail. You engage a prescription drug company, and that company has a deal with the pharmaceutical boys. So let's say that medication, whatever it is, is really 40 bucks. Now, you come along and get your Medicare Part D plan. Now, the plan, by law, has to pay for 75% of the $40 for you, so they're paying 30 bucks for you. Your contribution as a senior is 25%, so you're paying 10 bucks. Sounds like a pretty good deal so far. You're only paying 10 bucks for a $100 drug. Simple, huh? Now, over the course of a year, if the money's contributed by your prescription drug company and by you combined to hit this mystical number of $3,310, <clears throat> then what happens is the government comes in and says to the prescription drug company, you can back out now because you just hit the donut hole. And the donut hole is $4,850. It is, in fact, for you, the difference between $3,310 and $4,850, or you could be in for a run for $1,540 when you're in that chasm, I mean that hole. Now, when you get to the other side of this thing, 
Then the government comes back and it says, you must now pay for 95% of the, of the, of the client's uh, prescriptions for the rest of the year. That's called the catastrophic side. That's because it's catastrophic actually for the insurance carrier now, but not for you. <laughs> now, most of the time when people hit the donut hole is in the fourth quarter of the year, meaning now, usually, okay? And then it all renews at the beginning of the year. There's a way to avoid the donut hole, and that is to attend to this, to change your prescription plan every year during the open enrollment period. Even if your plan has been working fine for 2017, you're going to assume that my Humana plan will be the same in 2018, and that is ain't the case. You could suddenly find that you're paying a whole lot more for a medication than you were prior. Let me give you a, an example of this. A lady calls me up in the fall of 2015. She's not even my client, she's just asking a question. She says, I've got X amount of medica X medications, one of which is Premarin. She's paying 70 bucks a month on the Silver Script plan, and she's happy with this plan. She says, should I look at the new plans for 2016? I said, yes, absolutely, you should look. Make sure you do that. She didn't do anything. So come January now, 2016, she goes to her same pharmacy with the same Silver Script plan, and the lady behind the counter goes, oh my, that's 700 bucks. <laughs> what happened? It basically meant in 2015, that plan, that Silver Script plan, had a good buy into the medication, in this case, Premarin, but it didn't even buy into it in 2016. So the leg is on the hook now because she didn't do anything up until December 7th, which is the one, the one and only time she can make a change. Now she's stuck with it for the rest of the year. Or she probably went to Canada to get the stuff, but I don't know. But nevertheless, if she had simply gone to the database and looked at this during the open enrollment period, she would never have had the problem. Now, database. How do you know what's the right plan? I mean, there's like 40 different plans in every zip code. You don't buy it by how much the premium is. That's the worst way to go. What you want to do is use a database. Oh, and by the way, anybody else an insurance agent in here? <laughs> do not buy a prescription drug plan from an agent. Here's the reason why. Let's say I was appointed to the Aetna 123RX plan. I'm getting the commission to sell it, right? I might be inclined to want to represent that plan to you, but it doesn't mean that that plan has a good buy into the medications you take, which means I'm serving me, not you. And you could get screwed basically along the way. So don't buy it from an agent. Use the impartiality of a database. You won't go wrong. Now there's a couple of ways to do this. You can go to a senior center, or you can go to a Department of Aging, and guess what they're going to do? They're going to go right there, Medicare.gov. Or, if you're not real good with computers yourself on the computer, but if you're not great with a computer, don't worry, there's another way. Can you use a telephone? If they can use a telephone, you can call CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. You then have sitting in front of you your medications, and you tell them at CMS exactly what you're taking, and yes, you have to be real specific. What's the milligram, what's the dosage, what's the real name? They'll enter it into the database for you, they'll recommend the plan for you, and they'll set you up. Here's one real big hint about CMS. It services 57.7 million people. It's a real busy agency, right? And most people think it's only open from 9 to 5. Uh-uh. 24-7. What you want to do is contact them at 9 o'clock at night with your, ball, with your glass of Chardonnay and, and very methodically go through this. And you can do this. I only have to do this on a once-a-year basis, okay? But if you're better at this stuff and you want to do it on your own, which a lot of people do, well, not that many people do, but you go to a, a database like this. So let me show you something here. Yeah. Things are sliding here. Oh, 
Hello. All right. Oh, right. You click on the part that says find health and drug plans. The health plans, by the way, they're referring to there are the Advantage plans. But in this exercise, we're not looking at the Advantage plans, we're just looking at the prescription drug plans. I'm going to put in, whoops, touchy, I'm used to my apple. I'm putting in my zip code because these are zip code dependent. And if you're on original Medicare, I'm going to go up here to tell the database, wherever this cursor is. And I'm going to go down to this part right here. They're wanting to know if somebody is actually on, actually on um, state aid. If you're not, like most people aren't, then you click on this, I don't take, I don't have any extra help. Then you click on... Click on the plan, results. Now, this thing's driving me nuts. Okay, I'm going to put in here, I missed my apple. <laughs> that mouse is not real easy. <laughs> Oh, there's a mouse here? No. Oh, there is. <laughs> cool. Except that it's not working. Okay. Ah. I don't know why this thing is changing. Is anybody good with this crap? Um, Can I be your assistant? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Please do. We get that thing in the middle of the picture okay. again? Yep. I was just using that. Well, let's just do this. I can, I can, I can help you out here. All right, what, what drug do you want to enter? Put in there, yep. um, put in uh, Losartan. How do you spell it? L O S, it'll tell you. L O S A R. Sorry, put, it, put that one in. This one? No, the one above. Okay. Okay? Yep. Put in there then what the actual milligram is. Let's say it's 100. Okay. Okay? Yep. All right. Let's say you want to get three months at a time. So you put in 90 in three months. Oh, 90. Okay. Mm -hmm. Change that to 90. Yep. Okay. Okay. Add the drug. Okay. Okay. Put in. Uh, a Torvastin, whatever it's called, A-S-T. I can't Oops. spell or understand A -S -T. any of the names for these drugs. This one? Uh, that one? This one. This one? No, a calcium. That one. That one. That one. Okay. Um, just put in 30, I mean 90 rather, of, of that level. Okay. okay, yep. All right. Three in three months. Three months. Okay. okay. Add. Yep. Okay. All right. I've just put in two drugs. That's all I've done, right? So let's go to click on drug list ID. I mean drug list complete. Okay. All right. Now we're going to pick our, we're going to open this up now, and expand, expand this out to like 13 miles. This is near where I live, so I know where these things are. Okay. okay. Oops, sorry. All right. I want you to put in there CVS, Middletown, which I think is... Okay, so do I? Oops. Oops, there it is. It, 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 whoa. What happened there? <laughs> whoa. Okay, oh, okay, we're good. We're good. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> Go, a little bit up to Middletown right there. Man, I understand why you had trouble here. Yeah, I don't know it's what's like, going on with this thing. The mouse does not work. and Right, uh, and it doesn't like your whoop, finger okay. either. Okay. CBS, which one? Middletown? <laughs> Middletown, Middletown, right. Yeah. Add pharmacy? Yeah, add pharmacy. Okay. In other words, you have to tell it that you want to have a pharmacy, right? So I'm going to put in just one. For, 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 All right. Do I say, go back up? Let's go to the bottom of this thing now. and Let's let's go to the next level. Man. Yeah. Continue the plan results. Okay. All right. And then click on the button that says prescription drug plans with original Medicare. These are not with the Advantage plans. Okay. And then click on continue the plan results. Now, what just happened is the database is going out there to look at all the different possible. Microphone. 
The database is trying to go out there and find what's the best possible plan based upon my summary of medications. And the first one that comes up is almost always the plan you want. And this is called the Envision RX Plus plan. You'll notice how it says, if we can see the silly thing going. It's um, not. Yeah, it's, we'll do it here. Really um, it's $12.60. $12. Oh, but you'll also notice this. It says here, your cost as of today, meaning from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, including the premium, is $167. Now, if you back the premium out of that, that's $151. So over and above the $151 for what you have to pay just for the premium, you'll have some minor out-of-pocket. What is that? Uh, seven, 16 bucks or something? Now you divide that $16 by 12 months, and you're basically paying about a buck and a half for those medications. You know what your out of pocket is going to be. And they're telling you that you have the potential for a deductible of $300. But you don't have to pay for that at all, deal with that, if it's a tier one generic medication. On the other hand, if it gets to tier two or three or four or something like that, sure, that means that plan's got to get it for you but you could then have substantial out-of-pocket. So you're setting these things up to deal with the medications you happen to take now. This is your maintenance medications. And you could have a deductible, rather co-payment of anywhere from a buck to 29 bucks, and co-insurance could be as much as 27 to 39%. Now, everything below this level is gonna get worse. That's why the first one that comes up is almost always the one you want. And you'll notice over here, there's a, it's a three-star rating out of five. For the record, I've never seen a five-star plan. Not everybody likes these things. <laughs> so three or four is actually not bad. Now that's a good deal for somebody taking a couple of cheap generic medications. And even if they do sometime during the year have to go to something different, like say Crest or a brand name uh, product of some kind, then that plan will get it. But you may have a bunch of extra money out of pocket until the next open enrollment. See, the government is basically pretty smart about this one thing. Human health changes, and you want to make sure that what you're putting in there is the data you're dealing with for right now, but if life changes, then during the open enrollment period, change your plan. Everybody should change your plan every year. Now, let's put in another medication. Let's, let's go back up here. Uh -huh. Now we're going to go back to my drugs. Oops, this one? Uh, no. Up here, enter drugs. Okay. Now I want you to put uh, Humalog in there. Oops. Humalog. This one? This yeah, one? no, put in the um, quick pen. Quick. That one? Pen. No. That was oh. one above it. Cancel that. Yeah. Oh, it's a quick pen? That's fine. Oh. Go with that. Uh, all right, we're putting in a, 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 a drug that has no equivalent and it has no generic equivalent. Okay, it's called Humalog. All right, and is it in there? Yes. Oh, it's not in there yet. Sorry, which one do you want me to add? Go to the top one. The top one? Yep. Add drug. Okay. Yep. Uh, just keep it the way it is. Okay. And just add it in. Okay. Okay. Yep. Now, my drug list is complete. In other words, I've added a drug now. One drug. And now we're going to go back to the data to tell us what to get. What if you don't take any meds? Then you should, okay. But and you're lucky. <laughs> if you don't take any meds. You, put, you have to put in one. No, you don't. Well, I tried it and wouldn't let me go forward. Kept telling me put in one. Well, there's a button above that that says I don't take any drugs. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And if you don't take any drugs. Not, not, not legal ones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was good. Well, we won't talk about that. We're not going to sign anybody. I know, I <laughs> So, you go back down to the bottom of this and, and move on to the next screen again. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay. okay. What um, if you don't take any? <laughs> what, what kind of plan do you go with? Well, well, the first one that came up was the cheapest one. That's the one you go with. Okay. But here, here's the reason behind all of this. Um, Medicare Part D, as you probably know, maybe you don't know, is voluntary. You do not have to have a prescription drug plan at all if you don't want one. Did you know that? But the government says, if you don't get one, we're going to slap you down someday in the future. Right. So when you decide to get it, you're going to get a penalty. And the penalty, let's say you wait two years, 24 months, and then you get set up on a prescription drug plan. 
you're going to get a, a penalty of of uh, of one percent for every month that you could have had it. So let's say you get a plan and it costs twenty bucks. Add twenty four percent then, and it's lifetime. It never ends. So and so let's say five years later you have one that costs fifty bucks. It'll be fifty dollars plus twenty four percent because you didn't do it right the first time. Actually, you have 63 days to make it right, but that's our government telling us that they want you to have drugs. <laughs> okay, so what happened, no, but yeah, what happened here just now then, if this just changed pretty dramatically, all we did was add a drug, and it went, and they go up just a little higher. Well, the premium didn't go up, whoop, that's the right direction. <laughs> Which way you want to go? Yeah, keep that going. Way. You're doing fine. Oh, you keep going. Yeah, yeah, good. Now, you'll notice how just because we added one medication, the Humalog, which is not cheap stuff, this plan will get it, cost you 26 bucks, but look at your annual cost, 1994 bucks. And it becomes an insurance company. Yeah, and a, different, and a different plan. That means the Envision plan was not a good plan based upon the medication. You don't want that plan. You want to have one that accommodates that medication better than the other one. And this is telling you that. And it's telling you it's a little cheaper if you do it actually uh, through the mail. Now, it's also telling you this particular plan has a $405 deductible, which I guarantee you're going to have to meet. And your premiums, any, I mean, your, your co-payment's anywhere from a buck to 18 bucks. And your co-insurance can be as high as 25 to 47%. You'll notice, though, that it does have a nice star rating, a four-star rating out of five which is really as good as anybody's going to get. Now, below this level, everything else is going to get worse. Now, we could make this thing uh -huh. go down, farther uh -huh. down to Envision, where we were before. Oh, you're doing good. It must be the magic finger. Can I ask okay. you something? Yeah. I figured out the technique now. You're supposed to enroll at 65, but, like, I don't officially, I can't officially retire maximum Social Security until I'm 66. So I'm really confused... I'm on an employer plan, and I'm going to, I want to stay on that employer plan. You can, no problem. But then am I going to be penalized? No, because you're on the employer plan. Oh, I'm sorry. Say that again. Okay. Okay, they, the magic age is 65 for Medicare, but the magic age for retirement is 66 and a half. So I'm not planning, I mean, I'm planning to stay to 66 and a half employed at least, and so... It's really confusing to me. If I stay on my employer plan, am I going to get penalized? Do I have to still call Medicare when I'm 65? What am I supposed to do? Worry not. We have a system for this. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, you can stay on an employer's plan past 65 as long as you want. If you want to work to 70, feel free. Okay? Please. Or whatever. <laughs> but all you really should do at 65 is sign up for Medicare Part a just part a and the reason for that is what 10 minutes well <laughs> 10 minutes what that means is you can basically have this the part a assist the employer plan that you're still on okay and then when you part when you take part b then when you want it and you connect it then then you actually start paying for it you don't want to turn it on until you need it, right. right? Right. Also, there's another really important point behind not turning on Part B until you need it, and that is open enrollment for you. Your personal open enrollment always begins when Part B begins. So let's say you don't start your Part B until you're 70 years old. There will be no questions on an application about your pre-existing health conditions. If you did start early for no reason whatsoever, then after the first six months of being on Part B, your Medicare supplement companies get to ask about pre-existing conditions. And yes, you can be denied. And that's why you don't want to do it. You don't want to turn on your Part B until you need it. And the way to turn on Part B, instead of signing up online, which you can do prior to 65, you do it an old-fashioned way, which is to say with paper. And you have to get from your employer proof that you've had continuous coverage, which is easy, and it costs you nothing, and it prevents you from getting a penalty. And then you, you put on another form. This is a form saying, I want my Part B to begin at the beginning of some month. 
So let's say you don't want to retire until you're 70 years old in June that you wanted to start. Those two forms then go to your local Social Security office, which is always a treat, by the way. <laughs> go to your Social Security office, and a lot of those offices have a drop box on the outside instead of having to sit for hours in there. Okay, so, so in this, in this manner then, basically what you're doing is you're telling Social Security, I've been covered, don't worry about it, and now I want my Part B to begin. Okay? Make copies of everything. Yes, make, Every copies, make copies of everything. Yes. Social Security is a pretty burdened place right now. I mean, my, my, my brother was going to get uh, his Social Security, his wife says to him, and they live in Ashburn, Virginia. And she says, let's not go to the one in Ashburn because it's just so busy. So they decided they're going to go to Winchester, Virginia instead. They get to Winchester, Virginia. <laughs> There's two armed guards there. <laughs> the agents are behind bulletproof glass. <laughs> the benches are actually uh, nailed to the floor so they can't throw them at the people behind the counter. <laughs> so they decided to go back to Ashburn. <laughs> so we asked the Social Security Administration it could be kind of tough at times. Columbia, Columbia also has armed guards now. Yeah, yeah. Armed guards one Columbia person now. in at a time. Wow. Really? If you call Social Security to set up an appointment, they will take you on time, whatever your office may say. Maybe two weeks to you can go in. If you have a 2 o'clock appointment, they will take you at 2 o'clock. They will take you all ahead of all the people sitting there. Good job. Good job. Oh, right. Okay. And this would have one thing. We never got down to. I wanted to point out here that we were, on the original one, we were on Envision. But Envision isn't even showing up now. Because when we went to the Humalog, it would have been very obvious that if we, we went to the Envision plan that was $12.60 originally, it would have been insanely expensive. That's why you always go with the one, first one or second one that comes up, because it's got the best buy into the combination, the, the summary of medications that you take. So listen to a database. It's in your best interest, instead of just letting this go from year to year. Because if you do, you're going to get screwed and end up in the donut hole. It's in your best interest to deal with this. Take a couple questions. Just real quick, what is the purpose of STARI if the objective is to, to basically Go for the lower price. I mean, quality. What do you care about? Qu the quality of the service. I mean, is that bad? In some yeah. Cases? Oh yeah. Let's say you've got a policy that's got one and a half stars. You're not going to like it anywhere near as much as you like one four stars. But it's not really based upon. Most of the stuff is really based upon the summary of the medications and what plans got the best deal. Okay. It's all about that. It's all about the data. They could be relatively new. You know, they just aren't as good at it as other companies have been in for a long time. Gotcha. Sir, you had a question over here? Yeah. Let him go first. I'm 68 and a half. I plan to work until uh, at least 70 and a half to max my Social Security. I did not sign up for Part A at 65. Uh, is anything bad going to happen? Should I just go home and sign up? And... <laughs> yeah, you can, go, you can go home and sign up. If you get if you go online to uh, Medicare.gov, there's another button here. Oh, crap. But anyway, there's another. <laughs> there's another button on there that says uh, Apply for Medicare. All right, and it's like a two part. The first time you got you get a confirmation number, stop there, because then you just get Part A. Don't go beyond that because then you're going to end up getting Part B. And you don't want that. So it doesn't hurt to have that along with your social with your employer's group plan. Take one down here. Yeah. So F and G. Correct me if I'm wrong. The only difference between them to start off is that G doesn't cover the deductible for Part B. That's right. Um, I had once been told that if you're healthy enough and can get into G, you're better off in G, and that historically the premiums did not rise as fast in G as they do in F. That's right. Let me kind of explain something here. Some of you may be old enough to be on something called Plan J. Right? Does J exist anymore? No. Yeah. Um, there are certain plans that were discontinued in 2010. That would be J, H, and E. And what happened was this. J was the uh, 
Mac Daddy. It was the best. It was the top of the line. But it took this United States 40 years to fill that sucker up to the point where the claims ratio was so much higher with that particular plan than any other that it became too expensive for anybody. So they discontinued that plan in 2010, and they created an all-new best plan of all, comprehensive plan, and that would be F. But from 2010 until now, they already know there's so many people in plan F that the claims ratio is getting out of hand already. And the premiums are going to have to escalate again and again and again. And then, last year, the government announced it's going to discontinue the offering, in other words, not taken away from it, but discontinue the offering of Plan F in 2020. The premiums are going to skyrocket. In fact, they are already. I had a client went from F to G, and he's with Care First, he was 70 years old, that he'd gotten a 44% increase. And I moved him to G and saved him $137 a month. Do you have to pass that medical question yes, to get you into do. G? Yes, okay. you If you're past six months, then you have to ask, then I have to ask, anybody has to ask questions about pre-existing conditions. Let's say something about that, by the way. If you're 20, if, you're, if you have ma minor health issues like high cholesterol, acid reflux, you're type 2 diabetic, that sort of thing, they really don't care. On the other hand, if you've got a heart condition, cancer, heart lupus, all kinds of things, then they'll say that every one of the companies will say the same thing. Stick with what you got. You, they can't charge you any more than anybody else. You can't lose it, but we don't want you because you could cost us money. That's reality. So it all comes down to this. If you're past the first six months, they will look at pre-existing conditions. Like for Part D? No, this is, no, we're talking about for right, the Medigap right. plans, right. right. Now, the Part D doesn't matter. Regardless of pre-existing conditions, you have this one shot every year between October 15th and December 7th to uh, uh, change your plan. Oh, by the way, you can change your plan. You can enroll from October 15th to December 7th, but you don't get the plan until January 1. Yeah. From January 1 to February 14th, you'll love this, is a disenrollment period. Mm -hmm. What it means is you got to play with it for 45 days. If you like your new plan after the 14th, after Valentine's Day, you're done. If you don't like your new plan during that 45 days, you can actually snap back to the old plan. So there is a huge period of time to figure this out every year, from October 15th through February 14th. Yeah. If you're on an F, if you're on a plan F, let's say, can you switch to another company with a plan F that might have a lower premium? No. You have to stay with whoever you picked. Yes. Okay. If you have a pre so pick well. Yes. If you have a pre-existing condition. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I haven't sold a plan F in years. I figured this out a long time ago that it was going to go crazy. Well, if you, unfortunately, my husband was disabled before sixty-five, so he ended up on Medicare. So when he turned sixty-five, you're kind of stuck. Yeah. When you, in his. When somebody's disabled below the age of 65, in the state of Maryland, there's only two plans that you can get. Yeah. yeah. A or C or, or sometimes F. And that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you become 65, though, he could change to anything he wants. He has an all-new open enrollment at 65. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about pre-existing conditions. If you didn't I take wasn't it, told that. Yeah. It's too late. Yeah, well, he's stuck. Yeah. So that's interesting. So, so, so I have adult children who are disabled, and they receive Medicare. So this was the first year when we went for physicals, and the doctor couldn't order routine preventive blood work, she said, because they had no condition that Medicare would cover. Um, I was totally shocked because I'm, th I'm thinking, then you can't check cholesterol, you can't check blood sugars, nothing. And she said, that's right, because she's not sick. So I'm thinking... <laughs> what is this? Like she, you know, she's not going to have blood work till she's fifty. I mean, you know, I'm like, is that is that accurate? I was very shocked. It can be. It depends on okay. the only the only way to find out whether something is covered or not covered. Do not talk to your to your Medigap company. They don't know. All they do is fill gaps. You talk to CMS. They're the ones that really control the whole table. They're the ones that underwrite the risk. 
The Medigap companies underwrite nothing. They just fill gaps at the control of CMS. So who's the boss in all of this? CMS who, who talks in Latin. They're the ones to talk to. Thank I, you. I guess I'm out of here. <laughs> Was that powerful and helpful? Thank you, Mark. And um, some of you have already uh, asked for Mark's information, and and Mark didn't have a chance because we pulled him off the stage here. But his information, Mark, is back here on the on the table, and uh, Mark stood in uh, at the last minute for us, and I think did a wonderful job. So thank you very much, Mark. Okay, we're going to do a couple more baskets. All right, the next one is number nine. It's an Italian food basket. It's one of Deborah's favorite baskets to pull together. Just kind of have a hernia. It's full of pasta sauces and goodies from Sir Latab and... Um, William Sonoma, I believe. Right? So, it's got a lot of in there. so this is number nine. Rhonda Tomlinson. All right, number ten is. Oh, well, this one's going home with me. This is a Thanksgiving basket. Just in time to start your turkey holiday on this one. Um, again, it's it's William Sonoma Yummies. Um, I think there's a bottle of Riesling in there, and she's got a really cool cover over the wine bottle. It looks like a turkey, I think. All right, so this is number 10. Bill Mitchell. <laughs> Where's Bill? No? Oh, there you go, in the back. Very good. All right, we'll pick, we'll pick these all up. That was number 10. Yeah. All right, one more, and then um, we'll have Steve come up here. All right, this one is all about chocolate. So if you didn't like the Thanksgiving one, you're really going to like this one. Chocolate everything is in there. Um, caramels, chocolate waffles, chocolate coffee, chocolate everything. So this is number 11. We'll pick another one. This is, this is not And before I forget, very important in your packets is a survey. This year's uh, theme was enlarged, pulled from the results of the survey last year because we heard from you that you wanted a lot of information about health care. Please take the moment, two minutes, it's, it's very short, um, and fill that out before you leave. You can just leave them on the table and we'll pick them up um, when you leave. So please do that. Thank you. All right, so this one is all about chocolate. Tim Thompson. Okay. Today's last speaker is Mr. Stephen Elville, Principal of Elville and Associates. Many of you know Steve. His work is centered in elder law, special needs planning, and estate planning. And he earned his law degrees from the University of Baltimore, cum laude, and is a member of the Academy of Special Deans Planners, the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys, and the National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys. He was also named to the 2017 Maryland Super Lawyers list again this year. And we might have an announcement about 2018 soon, but that stays within this room. So um, I have much more to say about him. I could go on for two hours, but I won't, so I'll turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so you've been very patient. I hope it's going well. Uh, Jeff's going to get my PowerPoint up here. And uh, so we know Mark was powerful. Were, was Jan and Barbara powerful? Yeah. All right, and so I'm glad you got something out of that. And we're going to make, again, make uh, their email addresses available to you. So... I want to recognize a couple of people, and we're going to try to end as close to on time as we possibly can with a lot of things going on here. First of all, I want to thank Deborah, who is here somewhere. Uh, 
available. She'll come back in in a minute, I guess. But I wanted to recognize her for putting together all the baskets. And of course, Donna Greenwald, who is Gary's wife. I wanted to recognize some distinguished people in the audience. John Day, our financial advisor, who was our speaker last year. So thanks that John's here. Uh, Dr. Marion Bucklew, who is a professor of music at uh, Howard Community College, is here. Marion, if you could just wave to everybody. Um, and I wanted to recognize the attorneys and staff of Elville and Associates who are here. Uh, so if you could just stand up, Elville and Associates. Uh, not everyone could be here today, but thank you for these folks coming out. And um, also wanted to recognize Lucy Elville, my daughter, who's the audiovisual person, and I wanted to thank Bob Slattery for uh, saying last year, hey, why, is it, why wasn't this filmed? So we're filming it for those who can't be here today. Uh, I also wanted, Megan, if you could stand up again, I wanted to recognize Megan McCullough, who is a brand new attorney at our firm, although she's been practicing for many years, and she's our social security specialist. So if you have specialized social security questions or concerns, Megan is an expert in that area. Thank you, Megan. Okay, um, so let's uh, get into the last material now, which will be an elder law update. I'm just going to stand over here a little bit. Hopefully the clicker will work. I'm going to move this. You'll notice that uh, we're a little bit ahead on this slide. This is the 2017 annual event, so uh, not yet into 2018. Okay. <laughs> All right, trends in Maryland. So I'm going to make this quick. We want to try to end on time. We still want to talk about the client care program. Uh, Maryland remains a very liberal state with regard to Medicaid issues. So uh, we have legal solutions, right? Uh, we have financial collaboration with your financial advisors and tax people, and we want you to use those. But we don't want you to have to depend on Medicaid. But we're going to talk about the fact that sometimes Medicaid benefits or local Department of Social Services benefits and those kind of things are sometimes needed. I want to let you know where that stands today, basically. Uh, Mark talked about Medicare, so we're going to be talking a little bit about Medicaid here. So Maryland Mains remains a very liberal state. If you have a loved one who's moving from another state to Maryland, practically from day one they would be considered a Medicaid um, resident for Medicaid purposes in Maryland if they had to go to a nursing home. So Medicaid is very liberal in Maryland. Uh, but there are problems, and Mark alluded to the Affordable Care Act, which really was going to change how federal financing is done at, at the state level, state and federal financing of Medicaid. So we know there were two attempts to repeal that that did not happen. Had that happened, it would have greatly affected something that would be called the waivers in Maryland. So the best way to think of this is, on this end of the spectrum, if I'm impoverished, I will get unlimited, basically, Department of Social Services benefits. That's community-based Medicaid. On this end of the spectrum, if I'm impoverished and I qualify for it financially and physically, if I have a skilled level of care need, I will get Medicaid long-term care skilled nursing on an unlimited basis. So unlimited over here, basically, is a good way of thinking of it. Unlimited over here on the skilled nursing side. Now let's talk about that just a second. Is it expensive to spend down for Medicaid? Yes, especially if you have retirement type assets. In Maryland, those are counted. They're counted as spousal assets for, or personal assets for spend down purposes. So we'd have to pay all the tax on that if we had to spend down. So it's much better not to rely on Medicaid, much better to have a collaborative team, much better to have long-term care insurance or a long-term care hybrid product of some kind, like an annuity, John Day and others could talk to you, your financial advisors can talk to you about that, uh, or a um, life insurance with a hybrid rider of some kind. Uh, so waiver slots is the, is the part in the middle. So let's pretend that there's an adult daycare waiver, there's an older adults waiver, there's a traumatic brain injury waiver, some people in this room have had experience with that. So there's various waivers. Why does the government call it a waiver? Because on this end of the spectrum and on this end of the spectrum, the government mandates to the states, the federal government, that you have to provide benefits on an unlimited basis. But in the middle here, in the waiver slots, the government says to the states, federal government, you, we waive those requirements. So the states can only offer certain waivers if they want to. They don't have to provide unlimited amounts of waivers, so to speak. So let's talk about the what I will call the older adults waiver. The challenge, real quick, is that your loved ones or your relatives or friends that should be staying in their homes if they don't have enough money to pay for assisted living 
and they don't really want to live in a nursing home, if they could be maintained at home, or if they could live in assisted living, they could qualify for payment of that service through the waiver program. So it sounds too good to be true. And it is, because the waiver slots are below 5,000. And there's about 23 to 25,000 people consistently on the waivers, waiver waiting list, I should say. So if you're on the waiting list, there's not a good chance to get to the bottom, of course. How many people got the waiver last year? Just a guess. 147 out of 23,000. So this is not a good program, but it needs to be expanded. So there's challenges with the waiver slots. Uh, augmented estate. Now, Gary had mentioned this earlier. He talked about the potential of a passage of legislation that would expand the rights of a spouse to get one-third against his or her spouse's estate, and now expanding that to a revocable trust or other non-probate assets. That's called not just the probate estate, that's called the augmented estate. So uh, here's an example. If your child were doing planning, and I'll make this very brief, your child was doing planning and they wanted to make sure that their, their new spouse, let's say, could not make a spousal elective share claim of one-third against their estate or their revocable trust, what would be the best thing, in my opinion, to do? Get a prenuptial agreement. Get a prenuptial agreement as the first line of defense. So, but, but we're going to get into just now, what does that have to do with elder law? Well, what that has to do with is that there's an elder law technique where we can preserve most of the assets for a disabled spouse, believe it or not, and some of you have these plans, if there is a well spouse in the picture, and that well spouse would have died first. So we don't think in terms of the well spouse dying first, but if the well spouse were to die first, there is a federal law provides for a technique to use a will to preserve everything for a disabled spouse. And the augment of the state legislation that is currently being looked at over the last several years, and it has never been passed, but it's been looked at, that augment of the state legislation, when it, when it gets expanded to revocable trust and other non-probate assets, it will affect how much we can preserve for a disabled spouse under those conditions. So it will change how elder care uh, planning is done in that respect, and I do believe the augmented estate legislation will pass. It's being looked at over the last summer, and it's going to, they're going to try to pass it this year and the following year, and it will eventually pass. So augmented estate will affect how we do elder law. Cost of care continues to rise. That's no surprise. I won't spend time on that. Elder abuse continues to rise. We have clients, um, let's say clients under guardianship. I have one particular client that's lost almost a million dollars to lottery scammers. Oh and you have you've heard me tell that story before. So it's very real. Take it seriously. The scams are out there and they're serious. By the way, the state is or the legislature is having a hard time putting one foot in front of another to really have elder abuse laws that matter. So there's that's a constant struggle. I don't know what the big deal is, but there's there's not a whole lot going on out there in the but the elder, elder care community, elder law attorneys, are trying to ramp up elder abuse awareness and legislation. So why are clients coming to see elder law attorneys in 2017, 2018? Same reasons. Uh, sometimes there's a change of circumstances. You did your planning many years ago. Something has changed. There's, a, there's an impairment of some kind. A spouse has a, an issue that they didn't have before. So this might lead to a change or shift of planning. Pre-crisis planning, maybe you're coming to see an elder law attorney to maybe put your assets in advance out of reach of a Medicaid spend down. And of course, the Medicaid spend down is not the preferable way to go. We want you to collaborate and, and have the, the money and the resources and the long-term care insurance or products to deal with a crisis. And of course, when the crisis occurs, that's sometimes when people talk, look to elder law as, as a consultation to look at these following issues. Healthcare decision making, I won't go through this entire list in the interest of time. Asset protection, we're gonna talk about that just a little bit, and let's move on. So what is an elder law consultation? What I'm finding, even in conventional estate planning, I'm finding that sometimes with couples, and not everybody's married, 
But with couples, sometimes we stop right in the middle of today's conventional estate planning and really just shift gears for a moment. Because one of the spouses might be really concerned about what happens if a crisis occurs. I mean, we're both healthy now, but legally, what does that look like? So sometimes we'll stop and we'll do an hour, hour and a half just to shift gears and really put it in perspective. What literally happens when a crisis occurs and how do we deal with that? And that many times can help someone have a real peace of mind about their planning. So um, this elder law consultation in general is about goals. It's about getting rid of ambiguities and false information real quick. Someone was referred to me about four or five months ago. I met them on the Eastern Shore for an elder law consultation, a spouse, uh, two spouses. One of them has, let's say, beginning of mid-stages dementia. When I met them, I met them at a restaurant, and I don't usually meet clients at restaurants, but I met this particular person, and I could not get her to stop crying for 30 minutes because she was told so much false information from so many sources that sometimes the elder law consultation really just serves to get people back on the right track, give them some confidence about the future. They're not going to lose their house. They're not going to lose all their assets and so forth. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. So sometimes it serves as a basis for a planning shift. And again, a lot of anxiety and hopelessness out there in these kinds of situations. And what we want to do is give people the information to empower them. Sometimes there's weaknesses in the family structure. So not all kids get along. But, but in those situations, we want to deal with issues. how do we manage those issues. Okay. We're not going to get into too much now. We're way over time already. But uh, we don't have time to cover what we planned. But just know that asset protection is a conversation in elder law. Okay? But there are various types of asset protection. There's lifetime asset protection. There's asset protection in death. There's domestic asset protection, which we're going to talk about in our next client event, client care event. Um, and uh, there's asset protection for the, in the long-term care context, which is, of course, that elder care. So what I'm going to show you here, and I won't go into it now, we're going to talk about lifetime asset protection at our next two client care events from now in March. We're going to talk about lifetime asset protection, long-term care asset protection in, in that context, Asset protection at death, which many of you have already done for your children or nieces and nephews or grandchildren by further trust planning in your own documents. But we're going to really get granular on this and show you why. And Gary mentioned the Harris case, which is the poster, poster child case for how to not do it right in California. And that's an interesting case that we're going to get into more. All right. Uh, so again, people come to see elder law attorneys in 2017 and 18. How do I pay for the cost of care? Will I lose my home? How am I going to survive in the community? All of these things that you would expect. Do I need a guardianship? Um, how do I deal with the place of my, of my loved ones? Can I get veterans benefits and so forth? So because we're running five minutes over already, I'm going to skip through this and you have these slides. And of course, what we're really getting at here is that sometimes there needs to be a shift in planning. And sometimes, even during conventional planning, we need to discuss these issues because it might be so worrisome to you if you're married or single that you just want to know what is this all about for peace of mind purposes. All right. Uh, lastly, or almost lastly, get your powers of attorney updated. Keep them updated. We're going to talk about the client care updating program. We're avoiding guardianship of the person and property. Remember, that's the whole purpose of it. And if you have a revocable trust, that helps avoid guardianship of the property. Uh, Barbara and Jan talked about the MOLS form, so I'm going to get right to that. So, advanced directive. I, I was so happy that Jan, or, or Barbara basically said, the advanced directive is kind of non-technical. Where, where is it really getting us? Okay, And that's why you, you kind of need to customize your advanced directive as much as possible. Take a look at the MOLS forms. Take a look at the other alternative forms that are out there. It's very relevant. And one of the things I was talking to one of our clients about over here is that there's a worksheet. There's a worksheet. So we have the most form. And over here, we have the advanced medical directive. And somewhere in the middle, we have the worksheet. And that's what I was asking Barbara about when she was here. 
So if you want to take a look at that worksheet, go on the Attorney General's website and you can actually see it, or you can, we'll, we'll send it to you, or Gary will send it to you. But that is part of the conversation, and it's, it's very relevant. And Bob Slattery, again, being very proactive as he is, he reminded me on the break, Steve, we can have these conversations, I think you were saying, Bob, we can have these conversations, but where are they memorialized? All right, well, they're memorialized in a document somewhere, but where's the document and how can you access it when you need it? So Bob pointed out to me his DocuBank card, which is not unique to us. Anybody can have a DocuBank service, which is an old service that helps attorneys and their clients have their advanced medical directives online, and you can access this anywhere in the world. Um, so they send you a medical card, and that's what Bob was pointing out to me. Bob, I'll give this back to you before I forget it. Thank you, sir. Thanks for being proactive. But that's a prime example of this conversation, and you can have your most, you can have your most worksheet, you can have your customized advanced directive all online if you like that idea, and it's accessible anywhere in the world. Now, the state of Maryland has its registry, and they have activated the registry as of about two years ago, but it's supposed to have been active for 30 years, and it wasn't. So I wouldn't rely on that, and this DocuBank service is very inexpensive, okay? All right, so continuing relevance and importance, what Jan, what Barbara said, making sure people have access to your information. That's the elder law update. Um, I'll keep you in tune as we, tuned in, I should say, as we go forward in 2018. Gary, if you'll come up, we'll wrap up with the client care program. I appreciate your patience. We're running about 15 minutes behind. I know many of you need to get out on time. So let's get right into this. Um, there are many client care program members in the room, so thank you for being members of our client care program. And um, I'll stand over here, Gary. So uh, long story short, that Gary and I and our firms, we share a, a shared mission, and Gary will chime in here in just a minute, of caring for clients and making plans work. So that's what the purpose of the client care program is. We want to give you a quick overview here. And our mission and vision, of course, is shared. We don't believe in a static estate plan. So we want you to plan. We want you to maintain and update your plan. We don't have time to go into great detail on that. And then your plan will work at maturity when, when we are no longer living. So we're committed to doing that. And we, could, we attended the Client Maintenance Academy in Boston, Massachusetts about a year and a half ago. And we went through their program and Gary and I and our respective firms became the 42nd and 43rd firms Gary, I think I was 40 seconds, um, <laughs> to get in that program. And so we're very proud of that. And Vincent Bonazzoli, an attorney in Boston, he's, he's the, the vision of that process. So we want to make sure planning works throughout life as intended. Continuous contact, that's really the purpose of it. That's really the purpose of it. Continuous contact. Those of you who know me know that the statistics basically say the average person only updates their planning every 19 years. And so 19 years, a lot of things can change. And we just want to make sure your plan does not fail, and some plans do fail. Uh, so we want to provide you with ongoing access, encourage you to come in. Our program talks about two hours, basically, of discounted attorney time per year. We have four client education workshops. Gary's going to talk about the one coming up in December. Uh, we want to do document updates at least every other year, so you're way ahead of the ballgame if you, if you come in and update at least every other year, uh, and other changes in your life. Changes in children's addresses, changes in lifestyles, changes in health, anything that needs to be updated. We want to align your assets. Arguably, the most important thing in estate planning is how your assets are owned at the time of death. That's arguably the most important thing. So we want to align those assets with your plan. We want to have a family meeting, and a collaborative meeting with your advisors. So we want to be inclusive, and we want to educate your beneficiaries. If you're protecting them from the claims of predators or bad marriages, do they need to know what's happening? Yes, and they want to be educated. DocuBank, Bob just pointed this out to us. Here it is again, the DocuBank program. Everplans is going to be very personal to you. We offer that to you. It's a, basically a, an electronic archive of all your important documents, 
uh, memoirs, everything, you can upload this into a, an electronic archive. Some people, some people like, like that, some, some people, people don't, don't, but we want to make it, it, aware, make make it available, available to you. you. That way, you're not only organized, you're not only updated, I should say, but you're organized. All right, so we charge uh, a fee of $8.50 per year, billed once a year for this. Uh, my client care coordinator is Mary Kramer. Gary's is Dan Greenwald. And if you need information on client care program, it's in the back uh, as you leave. Um, so a year ago, basically, uh, almost a year ago, we did our first client care workshop after the client event last year. And it was what to do upon the death of a friend or loved one, the post-mortem process. So that was our first client care program meeting. Uh, then we did a trustee workshop in April of this year. Then we did a social event at Prince George's Stadium in, in uh, PG County uh, for the Bay Sox. And you saw some of those photos when you came in. We tried to do a slideshow of that. It was a very hot day, but it was good. And there was a lot of kids, a lot of kids. Now we have our next workshop, and Gary's going to talk about that. So our next workshop is going to be the second Saturday in December. We're going to have a workshop where we're going to bring in a speaker to talk about Social Security benefits. There are different theories on how best to maximize your Social Security benefits, different theories on when to claim them, certain theories on when not to, certain theories on, on how your benefits are actually uh, uh, figured out. So that's going to take place at the Anne Arundel Community College, is that correct? That's Thank correct, you. yeah. Um, and we'll start again at uh, 8.30 in the morning. Um, we're not, it's not going to be an entire morning, but what we're going to do is be bringing in, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, Kurt, Kurt Sarnowski. It's 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock? Yeah, yeah, and we're going we're gonna to do this at, Jeff, is it 10? 10 o'clock, yes, you're not going to have to get up as early, uh, but Gary and I are up early. Okay. I knew that I was testing you. Now, um, as you know, it, uh, November is right around the corner, and December is when our next uh, event's going to take place, and we're now right in the middle of football season. So let me ask you, how many people here are Ravens fans? Okay. How many people are Redskins fans? That's what I like to hear. And I'm not going to ask how many people are Cowboys fans. <laughs> So if you are a Cowboys fan, please keep your hands down. Why, why am I saying this? Because at our next event, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have a little bit of fun. Anybody who comes to the next event wearing the gear of their favorite football team, and in fact, we're going to expand this to a favorite athletic team, will be eligible for a special drawing. I'm not going to mention it to it now, mainly because we haven't figured it out what the prize is going to be. <laughs> But it'll be a worthwhile presence, so please come in your football gear or your athletic gear, whatever it may be, and you'll no be helmets. eligible for a pardon? No helmets. No helmets. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, this looks like a relatively young crowd. I don't think anybody here is yet 65 years of age. <laughs> but if you are wondering how secure Social Security works, I don't know if he'll be able to tell you what he thinks the future of it is going to be. I don't think anybody knows. But basically, I think the, the common thinking is that if you're already in your late 50s or early 60s, no matter what may happen to Social Security, I think people who are in that age group will be relatively safe. So um, since I'll be 65 years of age in about 20, 25 years, I'm very interested in, in finding out what, what my rights will be. It looks like a very promising event. We're really excited about it. We're actually flying them in from Boston, Massachusetts. So we're not going to be presenting somebody um, who works for a financial institution he actually used to work for Social Security. And he's been highly recommended to us, and we're very much excited about Mr. Zarnowski. And we're going to wrap up here with our last slide. And our last prize, as I will say. So if you're interested in the client care program, we, have, we appreciate your interest. We want your planning to work, and uh, we want to schedule a next meeting to, to take a look at that, look at the, at the agreement, and we want you to come to the December 9th meeting to take a look at the program and and be a part of it. I'm, I can't, go ahead, Karen. Yeah, I, not only are our client care members invited, please bring your adult children if you'd like, whoever you have appointed as your successor trustees. We'd like to not only teach you all, but also your family about all these different uh, aspects of that estate planning. And sometimes uh, I've been accused of really not getting granular on certain things, and so I want to be very clear. And I didn't write this. this. These are the words of Vincent Bonazzoli, who really created the Client Maintenance Academy. 
he said to me, Steve, try to, communi try to communicate this to the clients. When you're not a member of the client care program, for example, and you're not following up, let's say, every year or two with your planning, you're really expecting your team, whether it's your attorney, your CPA, your advisor, you're expecting them to kind of deal with your estate at some unknown time in the future, this, these are his words, at a time when there are unknown laws that will be in existence in the future, for a certain amount of unknown assets that you may have, of certain value or certain character, uh, for an unknown family structure at that time in the future, and for things that might be important to you at the end of your life that are now unknown. So I thought I'd share that with you. That's really his words about why uh, maintaining your planning is important, and we appreciate your commitment, commitment to that. All right, so I appreciate your patience that you're 15 and 20 minutes over our time. Roseanne, I think we have some final prizes.